Welcome. Can you go in first? Hello, everyone. I hope that everyone is able to see us now. Um, we apologize for the inconvenience in starting this a little bit early, uh, a little bit later. Um, we are uh, honored to have uh, Dr. Monica Munoz with us, Munoz Martinez with us today, and uh, thank you so much for uh, for your grace in in uh, in, in uh, uh, understanding our, our, our few technical problems that we had. So um, I will introduce uh, Dr. Monica Munoz um, Martinez. She is an associate professor of history at the University of Texas at Austin. Her first book, The Injustice Never Leaves You, Anti-Mexican Violence in Texas, received six book awards. She co-founded she co-founded the award-winning project, Refusing to Forget, and helped to secure four state historical markers commemorating the history of anti-Mexican violence. Uh, Dr. Martinez is a 2021 MacArthur Foundation Fellow, a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians, and member of the Board of the Advisors of the Recovering the U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage Program. And we are uh, truly honored to have her um, speak with us today. And so without further ado, I'll, I'll uh, let her um, uh, begin her presentation. Please feel free to um, submit your questions via chat and we will share them with her uh, at the end of her of her presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that um, introduction and for helping me on the back end to get into the webinar. My apologies, um, you know, we are still, uh, I, I'm so thrilled that the conference committee um, is, is pulling together this conference virtually still, um, I think in an acknowledgement of the many communities that are still struggling with COVID and, and, the, and the resurgent pandemic. And I am certainly a family um, that has vulnerable um, family members. So, so for all of the technical glitches, I, I am, am grateful for the opportunity to join virtually. Um, thank you so much to all of the staff that's working behind the scenes, especially to Lorena, who just answered, you know, 10 of my emails. Um, and to Dr. Ventura, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm truly honored to be um, invited to participate as a keynote in this conference. I um, want to share uh, a bit about my book, The Injustice Never Leaves You, which is a project uh, that wouldn't have been possible without the Recovering the U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage Project. In I was a graduate student in 2010 when I received the Texas grant, which allowed me to spend six months in Texas um, and make return trips uh, to, to build the archive that I needed to write the book, The Injustice Never Leaves You. Um, so I, I am so grateful to the work that Dr. Ganelos and, and other members in the project have done to create opportunities uh, for scholars like myself uh, to join the academy um, and to thrive uh, because the Recovering Hispanic, uh, U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage Project has recognized that to do the work that we that we want to do to recover the histories and write about the the literary cultures that we want to write about we we realize and the project has realized um, that we actually have to build those archives and, and preserve those documents and those newspapers um, and so the Texas grant allowed me to do that important work so I'm going to share my screen um, my PowerPoint and I'll go ahead and play it just with, to start with um, a quick overview of my book, The Injustice Never Leaves You, A History of Anti-Mexican Violence. Um, in writing this book, I realized that although the history of anti-Mexican violence was a history that was still felt and weighed on Mexican-American and Latinx communities in the United States, it was a history that had largely been forgotten. Um, in the United States by popular audiences, but also um, uh, in, in Texas in particular, the history of anti-Mexican had actually been uh, celebrated. It was presented in, in the media, it was presented in films, and it was presented um, it, to the public as a period of progress. And so my work recovered a period of violence, the peak of anti-Mexican violence um, between 1910 and 1920, a, a period known as La Matanza, um, the massacre. It's Historians have estimated that um, anywhere from 500 to, to thousands um, of, of ethnic Mexicans, both Mexican nationals living in Texas and also um, people of Mexican descent with American citizenship died, uh, were murdered 
uh, they were victims of racist violence during this period. It's important to remember that during this period of anti-Mexican violence, victims were denied due process. Um, they were criminalized as bandits, as a foreign threat, as murderers, and as thieves um, by politicians, by local residents, and also in the press. And so um, there was public support for uh, brutality um, and, and for the denial of uh, the basic rights of due process for people who in some cases uh, were, were killed and targeted for murder only because they were in the vicinity of, of a, where an event of violence or a robbery took place. I found in the research for this book uh, quite what was quite troubling was that there were no protections uh, for people uh, who looked Mexican or who were believed to be Mexican. Uh, citizenship did not protect people. Gender did not protect uh, people from being targeted with violence. Class, age, um, and status, social status in communities did not protect people from violence. One of the, the youngest victims that I found um, was a young named, girl named Concepcion uh, who was shot and killed when she was crossing from uh, the Texas side of the border into Mexico with her mother and her tia. Um, she was only nine years old and she was uh, her she and her mother and Thea were um, shot at by a US soldier um, and she was killed. So again, uh, you know, not gender, not age, but even uh, not even social position uh, protected people from intimidation. Just one of the earlier presentations today referenced uh, JT Canales, a state representative from Brownsville who was threatened uh, for uh, leading an investigation into Texas Ranger abuse in 1919. Another thing that I found in writing this book was that aggressors of racial violence included vigilantes, uh, but also local law enforcement, Texas Rangers, the state police, and US soldiers. And so that led me to write about this uh, as a period of state sanctioned violence, violence that was called for by political officials, by local officials, but was also violence at the hands of law enforcement officers. And in many cases, coordinating posses uh, that included um, civilian residents. Unfortunately, these aggressors acted with impunity. Um, state police were offered uh, to be pardoned by governors if, they're, if they were ever indicted or, or charged for crimes. Um, and so on the whole, uh, in, a, in addition to this being a period of, of extreme terror and violence, it was also a period, uh, a, a, an additional layer of the kinds of violence and intimidation um, was articulated in the fact that, that these aggressors uh, were not prosecuted or, or charged for any of their crimes. Um, and so uh, for survivors, for, for, for people who had loved ones that were killed or people who witnessed violence, it was also a period of intimidation knowing that some of the law enforcement agents that had committed these crimes uh, were still in law enforcement and actually had long celebrated careers. And so it was a, a, an additional form of intimidation. Some of the challenges uh, for conducting this research in, include that the state records of this period of violence um, is a corrupt archive. It's written by some of those Texas Rangers that committed acts of violence. Um, in, in reading widely across these institutional state archives, I found contradictions, I found false statements. Um, and, and it's also a corrupt archive um, because the, the, the state records, the legal archives in many cases, criminalized the victims um, and dehumanized them. And so there are unfortunately too many cases in the legal archive and the state records where the victims of police shootings um, were not even identified by name. They were rendered anonymous uh, in these records and instead described only as Mexican bandit or Mexican horse thief. Um, and so as a researcher who was asking about these cases of violence and looking to see what actually took place um, and who the victims were, um, there were a lot of uh, roadblocks for using, the, 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 the state archives had a lot of limits. Uh, for example, in that 1919 uh, state investigation into abuse by the Texas Rangers, uh, Claude B. Hudspeth, who was a representative, uh, congressional representative from South 
excuse me, from West Texas, testified endorsing the violence at the hands of the Texas Rangers by saying, quote, you've got to kill those Mexicans when you see them or they will kill you. Um, and, and of course, unfortunately, after the 1919 investigation, despite all of the crimes that were exposed, despite some testimonies from Texas Rangers, where Canales says, you know, this said uh, in the transcript, this person is is actually confessing to murder <laughs> under under oath, uh, despite the damning evidence, there were no prosecutions. Um, and instead, people like Claude B. Hudspeth continued to call for more policing on the U.S.-Mexico border. And he went on in 1924 to add a million dollar rider to the Immigration Act that was passed in 1924. Um, and that million dollar rider was specifically to to fund the, the establishment of the US Border Patrol. So this history of anti-Mexican violence can't be cordoned off you know, to the past. It is certainly a, a, a period of violence that, that shaped institutions um, like the Border Patrol um, that, that still exists today. So one of the ways that we can recover the history of anti-Mexican violence that, that I found um, was, was actually turning to communities. And it would have been impossible for me to write the book that I wrote if I had not been able to turn to community memories and to the private archives um, that people living in South Texas and in West Texas had in their homes. For example, uh, families and neighbors preserved the memories of events and the lives of victims um, and, and helped to document those events. Uh, communities in Texas preserved past memories of these events and their loved ones from generation to generation. Um, and so oral histories, by conducting oral histories with residents in South Texas, I was able to study not only the, the preserved memories, but also to meet people who had private archives in their homes, um, who had documents, who had photographs uh, that could provide me access to the faces of some of the victims and some of the survivors. The portrait on this slide was um, is in the home of Benita Alvarado and uh, a, a buddy Alvarado who live in Uvalde, Texas. Benita Alvarado unfortunately passed just this past year. Um, but she has this portrait, uh, her family had preserved this portrait of Juan Flores and his brother Narciso, who were both witnesses to the Bodonid massacre, which took place in 1918. And so um, this is one of the portraits that, uh, along with a, a home that was full of documents, of legal records. Um, and actually, when I was conducting an oral history with Benita Alvarado, she's the one that mentioned that her her grandmother, uh, who was also a witness and a survivor of the Bodvedid massacre in 1918, um, that her grandmother had uh, sued the U.S. government for the the massacre, for the for the involvement of the Texas Rangers in this massacre, and it was a moment in the oral history. Uh, you know, when I was conducting oral history that just stopped me in my tracks because I didn't know that you could sue the U.S. government. Well, it turned out through the U.S. Mexico General Claims Commission of 1923 that the widows and survivors that there were 12 widows. Um, and a grandfather of one of the victims that did indeed file a claim, an indemnity for an indemnity against the US government um, for the denial of justice um, and the involvement of law enforcement in the massacre. And so that led me to a large legal archive where I found other families of, of victims who were Mexican nationals who could turn to the Mexican government and seek aid in, in calling for investigations, um, and in the case where, uh, as the survivors of the Bodvedi massacre, where there were no prosecutions of the people involved in the massacre, um, they were able to try and seek justice through an international tribunal. So in this case, this was a, 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 an oral history that helped me to understand more, not only about the events of the massacre itself in 1918, but also to see how community members in the aftermath tried to seek justice and continued also uh, to preserve uh, the memories of the event and of those who were impacted, um, like her father, uh, Juan Flores.
I also was able to see photographs uh, like these that were shared with me by Norma Longoria Rodriguez, who is a resident of San Antonio. Um, on the left, it's a photograph of Antonio Longoria and his wife, Antonia. Um, and on the right, it's a photograph of Epigmenia Bazan and her uh, granddaughters and daughter um, on their porch. Um, the Antonio Longoria and Jesus Bazan, Antonia's uh, father, were both shot and killed in September 1915 by a posse that included a Texas Ranger and local residents. Um, and Antonia, uh, newly widowed, and Epigmenia Bazan, also widowed, um, were members of a landowning family that could trace their belonging back to a Spanish land grant. And so they were left uh, during a very violent period um, without their husbands, um, but unlike uh, some of the, the survivors of the Bodonit massacre, they did not call for public um, investigations into the double murder. Um, they didn't uh, vocalize public protests, but they did do something that was quite extraordinary. The, the two widows refused to leave their land. And so um, they, they refused to leave their homestead. And this was an era in, in which a common phrase was, you don't buy land from the widow, excuse me, you don't buy from the husband, you buy land from the widow. Um, and which, you know, speaks to the, the sort of gender dynamics of, of women and their vulnerability, especially um, if they were uh, of, of landed, uh, uh, landowning families. Um, and so so actually the descendants of uh, the Bazana Longoria family still uh, own portions of this land today. Um, but these were photographs that were not um, preserved in museums or state libraries or archives, but instead in the homes of descendants of Jesus Bazan and Antonio Longoria. So in terms of some of the lessons that I learned from building a, a, a record from community archives, I learned how important it is to recover the humanity of victims, of survivors and witnesses. And it was something that I, I could not have anticipated at the time when I was a graduate student writing my dissertation, that the book in itself could could act as a form of a memorialization, um, that writing about the lives of people like Antonio Longoria, Jesus Bazan, um, and, and other victims of racist violence and their families uh, could help to, to keep their names alive and to refuse to forget um, those families. Um, it also, I also learned and realized that if, if we center some of the, the descendants of, of this violence as a primary audience for our own writing and work, um, then we have to be sensitive, especially to how we present these violent events. And so how we write about the violence matters, um, uh, you know, avoiding sensational descriptions, not shying away from the brutality of the violence, but remembering that this is something that will be, that will be read by communities who identify with the victims. And so making sure that we attend to the kind of descriptions of, of violence and that we that we look for lost humanity in the archive um, as, a, as a part of our agenda. Norma Longoria Rodriguez shared with me uh, one of the, the, a, an important quote that actually inspired the title of my book. Um, it is, quote, it's an injustice, it never leaves you, it's inherited loss. And she expressed this to me when I asked her why she had spent so much time dedicated so many years of her life to trying to recover the history of Antonio Longoria and Jesus Bazan, her grandfather and great grandfather. Um, and she, ex she explained that she had, this was a history that had greatly impacted her life um, and that it was a feeling of injustice. And, and part of that injustice was, was not only the, the crime itself that took place in 1915, but also, but, but also that there had not been a state acknowledgement of this period of state sanctioned violence. Um, and instead that some of the Texas Rangers that, that participated in this brutality continued to be celebrated in museums and in popular culture. And so that longing sense of injustice in part was the, the failure to acknowledge this as a period of terror and and as uh, a tragedy. So I worked with uh, my colleagues in Refusing to Forget to, to, to 
curate an exhibit at the Bullock Museum. Um, and again, the Bullock Museum could turn to the Library of Congress, to <laughs> libraries across the country and internationally for uh, objects to commemorate that or, or the uh, uh, artifacts from Texas Ranger history, um, but they could not find photographs of victims or families that were impacted. And so part of the important work that I did in this contribution was to introduce families like the Longorias um, and the Alvarados to the staff at the Bullock um, so that their photographs could be on display and their family records could be on display in the exhibit. So again, remembering that the failure of state institutions to preserve these archives means that we still have a lot of work to do um, to recover them and to make sure that they're available to future generations. And this is a photograph of Norma Longoria Rodriguez, who's in the middle of the group photograph uh, on the right, um, and her uh, relatives and family members um, who helped to preserve, to document their family histories, uh, but also contributed to our efforts to have a Texas historical marker unveiled uh, to commemorate the Bazana Longoria murders. A difficult truth is that racial terror took many forms and the full extent of this violence is still unknown. And unfortunately, when I was researching the book, I found too many cases of not only anti-Mexican, but also anti-Black violence that I couldn't write about them all. And so that led me to start building a digital archive, a digital collection of cases of racist violence in Texas um, in 2014 with a group of research students at, at Brown University um, who helped me to build uh, uh, to start to build a, a slow archive um, of, of cases of racist violence in Texas. So the goal of the project is to create a record of interconnected histories of violence in Texas between 1900 and 1930 and the diverse strategies used to seek justice. So in addition to recording cases of, of racist violence, we are also documenting the histories of people who called for justice. Uh, we hope to inspire new research and also to identify new methods for digital storytelling. We wanna make these histories publicly available um, to inform public understandings of the past, but also to promote racial equity by informing pu public policy today. In terms of creating a record, we are documenting cases of racial, racially motivated acts of violence against multiple racial and ethnic groups. And so, um, you know, we're, we're documenting cases of violence against African American, ethnic Mexican, Asian American, Native American, and European immigrant minorities. And we are uh, including multiple forms of violence. This includes mob violence, extra legal violence by law enforcement, intimidation, torture, rape, mutilation, and physical assault. And it's important to remember that not every victim of uh, racist violence died. Um, and so I am, um, so we are collecting uh, acts of intimidation that, that shaped communities as well. Um, and we are, in terms of a strategy of developing a record that can represent the humanity of people impacted by this violence, we are recording information about victims, survivors, witnesses, and aggressors. And so um, it, I'll show a, a quick example. Oops. Um, and in, in terms of guiding the research team of undergraduates and graduate students that have participated and contributed to this work, both at Brown and now at the University of Texas at Austin, um, I emphasize always that we are researching people, not just events. Um, and, and so I want them to think more broadly than just trying to document what happened at, at, a, at a lynching or at a shooting, um, but instead to think about the people uh, that were impacted by this violence. Um, and another uh, you know, phrase that we think about in our research meetings is that we are focusing on lives, not metadata. And so although we are building uh, a data set and although we are thinking, you know, working with a database, um, that we want to collect information about lives and that that's always central to the work. Um, so one example, this is a 
the dying declaration of a young man named Toribi Rodriguez, who was shot and killed on a number, <laughs> on two separate occasions by um, Texas Rangers and local law enforcement in Brownsville. Um, this dying declaration was submitted into evidence during the 1919 investigation of Texas Ranger abuse. And although several historians had referenced this dying declaration, no historians had actually, uh, until recently, research this case in depth. Um, and so last semester, a group of students in my mapping violence uh, seminar, research seminar at UT Austin, collectively researched this case. And, and so what they ended up finding um, was that there were there was actually a large archive that could give us insight into this event, but also into the life of Toribio Rodriguez. For example, students uh, located the death certificate of Toribio Rodriguez um, that does identify that he was shot and killed, that his cause of death was a gunshot wound. Um, it includes the name of his parents. Um, his mother, Luz de los Santos, was born in Texas, and Ramon Rodriguez, his father, was born in Mexico. It includes his birth date, um, and it also includes the name of Florencio Gonzalez, who um, uh, identified the remains. And so this for as a for as a historian who has researched cases of racist violence was a gold mine. Um, unfortunately, many of the cases of, of racist violence, um, many of the victims, their, their their death was not documented by a death certificate. And so this was a, an extraordinary finding that led us to dozens of newspapers that that documented this event. Um, in this case, Toribio Rodriguez uh, was acknowledged and, and written about because he had just joined the local Brownsville police force. And so he was actually shot um, in the line of duty uh, while in investigating um, activities by the Texas Rangers. Um, and there was a funeral held for him um, that was attended by hundreds of people. His, uh, this shooting and the murder of Toribio Rodriguez was also documented in the Spanish language press. And for this project, I wanna say that it's been especially important to have access to Spanish language newspapers because in large part, in, when the English language press did cover cases of anti-Mexican violence, um, those that reporting almost always celebrates the violence, the lynching as an act of justice or a police shooting as an act of a law officer protecting you know, white American society. Um, and so often though that reporting is riddled with hate speech, racist and derogatory language. Um, and so although as a historian, you know, we study those newspaper articles and we find information that can lead us to more information, um, especially in the cases of anti-Mexican violence, the Spanish language press um, is such an important, provides such an important record for providing an alternative um, account of the events and for, um, introducing us to journalists who were documenting the violence and calling for justice. And so the, the importance of preserving Spanish language newspapers, um, I can't undermine, I can't, I can't articulate how important it is for allowing me and, and, and researchers to, to do this kind of work. The students in the class also um, found census records of Toribio Rodriguez and his family as they survived in Brownsville in the aftermath, but they also found census records um, to tell us more about the lives of aggressors, the people who participated in the shooting, but also in the witnesses, people who, the doctors who tended to him and the people who witnessed his dying declaration. So this is an example from a student submission on that research project of the kind of metadata that they collected about the location, about where they might, uh, uh, the geolocation for where they would put a dot on a map, their explanation, but also some of the metadata that they were collecting related to people, which includes for them a short biography of people like Toribio Rodriguez, but also um, Officer Puig, who was one of the officers uh, who invested investigated his shooting.
They include, uh, they're documenting and finding primary sources and adding things like research notes for future researchers uh, who wanna pick up uh, the trail um, of what students found. And they also, as a way of, again, memorializing, commemorating these lives, uh, write narratives about each event. And so there is a research team of, of uh, PhD students and master's students and undergraduate students who are paid um, to contribute research to this project. Um, the, this entry here is from an, uh, an undergraduate student from the Mapping Violence class last semester um, who contributed uh, to the collective research effort. And I'll, um, I just want to keep an eye on time. Oh, to, in terms of shifting to the conference theme and thinking about uh, the importance of documenting this history, I, I want to underscore that when we forget histories of viol racist violence, racial violence, we also forget the long struggles for social justice. And so um, when I think about the multiple audiences for a project like Mapping Violence, uh, one of the main audiences that I'm thinking about are children and students. And so it is important uh, that alongside this, this collection of events of racist violence, that we also build a social justice archive where we're collecting writings um, uh, by people uh, who, who protested, collecting depositions of, of witnesses uh, who, who testified, uh, hoping that, that, that aggressors would be prosecuted, um, and the legal records like the one that I referenced earlier, um, so that when we tell these histories, we have another entryway um, into doing it rather than starting from a moment of violence. So in terms of some of the data that we're collecting um, for this social justice part of the archive, uh, court claims, protests, journalism, legislation, international investigations, witness testimonies, and letters of protest, but also biographies of social justice advocates. Um, and so if we think about visualizations in addition to mapping, for example, the all of the locations of lynchings that we found, uh, we also want to map and visualize these social justice actions like the NAACP chapters across the state of Texas, court claims that were filed, civil rights conferences, and also uh, creating a social justice chronology. So these are just some of the early ideas that we have for how to, to, to represent um, this social justice archive visually. And of course, there's the work of creating K through 12 resources for teachers and students uh, for refusing to forget we created a lesson plan um, on Jovita Edad um, that encourages students to conduct oral histories with a family member, but also incorporates either a virtual trip to the Jovita Edad historical marker um, or uh, an in-person uh, trip uh, for those students from Laredo or the surrounding area. Um, I also want to say that, that some of the important work in recovering this violence is remembering that violence didn't happen in a vacuum, that these events of police shootings, of murders, of lynchings uh, were not isolated events. And they were not, you know, uh, they, they served a purpose in helping to create a new racial hierarchy, especially during the Jim Crow and Juan Crow era. And so um, when I teach about Jovita Edad in, in classes, it, students are overwhelmed in some cases because she's a journalist, she was a suffragist, she was a civil rights organizer, she was a cross-border organizer um, and a teacher, um, you know, in terms of her work of calling attention to anti-Mexican violence, segregation, labor exploitation, the militarization of the border and land displacement, her career can feel overwhelming. <laughs> you know, how did this one woman do so much? Um, that's in addition you know, to, to organizing conferences. But one of the ways that we can help to make her and the urgency of Jovi Daidad's work um, easier to understand is actually by placing her life's work within the context of the efforts to create 
a segregated society. And so a part of the Mapping Violence Project that has started this past year um, is actually creating a collection of race laws in Texas from 1836 to the present, um, a collection of, of Jim Crow laws and city ordinances, of Juan Crow laws and city ordinances, of black codes, slave codes, but also laws targeting indigenous populations, immigrant populations, and migrants. Um, and this is just a snapshot from like, you know, a not fancy Google sheet, um, but just a snapshot of if we think about the writing uh, that of Jovita Idar for La Cronica or for El Progreso, um, you can see the waves of laws that were passed, state statutes that were introduced um, to target voters of color, to introduce an English only society in schooling, but also in voting. Um, and so it, it helps me, even just this timeline, helps me to understand that in 1918, the year of the Bolognese massacre, that was a year when there were continued efforts to try to create an English only society. So the intolerance for Mexican lives was not only um, articulated through violence, but also through legislation. Um, and so it makes sense. It helps me to understand also the continued work um, to place the work of recovering the past um, in a more recent history. So in this photograph on the left, on the bottom photograph with the uh, top, sort of the scarf, that's my mother uh, uh, who was a, who participated in the Uvalde walkouts in 1970. Um, and my dad, who was voted uh, elected by his peers as a class favorite, he's in the top row, um, second from the right in the dark jacket with the turtleneck. Um, and I, I bring these uh, photographs uh, to your attention because when they walked out of schools in 1970 to protest segregation, they were also demanding access to Mexican American history, to Mexican American literature, to Mexican American studies. And so it is, um, uh, deeply uh, troubling that, you know, the writings of people like Olga uh, Munoz Rodriguez, who's my tia, uh, who was a journalist herself and created a newspaper. She was also a member of the Mexican American Parents Association that helped lead to a, 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 a lawsuit against the Uvalde School District. Um, that this has been a generational effort of trying to, to make sure that public school students in Texas have access to a history that can inspire them to imagine a better future. And so it is, you know, one of the, the reasons why I'm so proud and, uh, and inspired to be back in Texas doing this work at UT Austin for the opportunities to work with um, students and teachers. Um, but it is a, a, a moment in which the histories that we are recovering, the words of the, of the authors that we are preserving um, are, are being labeled as something that is inappropriate to be taught in schools. And so I think that the work um, that we are doing is, is all the more urgent today. Um, and I'm grateful also to the Recovery Project for helping to digitize the, the writings of Olga Rodriguez um, and helping to preserve that archive of our more recent uh, efforts for civil rights in South Texas. Um, because as important it is, as it is to recover the records from hundreds of years ago, uh, we have to learn from the efforts in the 1970s and 80s and, and even today. So. Um, I'll stop there uh, with, with so much thanks and gratitude uh, for everybody who made the time to join and I, I'll be happily answer questions. What a wonderful, what a wonderful presentation. You gave us lots of things to think about and to, and to consider. I invite um, people to um, add your questions to to either the chat or the Q&A that we have made available to you all. But um, I will start, I think to me, it's something that really struck out from your, from your presentation, Monica. There's uh, just so many uh, you know, amazing and powerful things. I can only imagine how um, traumatic and, and difficult it is um, for you to be working on this archive and, and sort of, I mean, as, as you're documenting these voices and centering these communities, you also yourself are uh, reliving, right? A lot of these uh, um, 
this violence, right, that, can, that, that continues to exist against our, our communities. So I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about like the, the importance, uh, you know, the, the role that you play, not only, I mean, we know the role that you play as a public historian, but also as a, just as a Latina, right? As a, as a young woman of color who is all working within academia and within all of these spaces to, to center the, uh, these communities. I don't know if, uh, if you could talk a little bit about that, um, um, just, you know, in terms of, you can talk about the challenges, but you, I think, uh, I think it's important for us to think about that human aspect as well. Thank you, that's such a, uh, thank you for that question. I think about this especially um, as a pedagogical question. So I think about what it means to bring these histories into the classroom. Um, I think about also what it means to invite students to research these histories and contribute to the Mapping Violence Project. So one of the approaches that I've taken for the research team um, of graduate students and undergraduates is to have regular meetings. And so the students are working in some cases in collaboration with, with somebody else, um, but, they're, but we're staying in, in constant dialogue. And so, uh, you know, that's weekly research meetings. And some of the meetings are for PhD students or for undergraduate students just to say, I'm having a really hard time reading through these records. And, and specifically when they're reading celebrations of the violence, when they're reading transcripts of Texas Rangers making jokes about the atrocities that they committed um, and dehumanizing the victims, um, when they're reading through newspaper articles that celebrate the violence, celebrate lynchings, um, that is a difficult history to confront. But, but I've also found that for students who are helping on this race laws project, that they have equally been overwhelmed by the tenacity, the continued commitment to try to create and, and reinforce a, a, a segregated society. And, and, and that has been, I think, an overwhelming uh, re, uh, archive to, 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 to study in its own way. Um, so I think part of it is, is, is the emphasis uh, and, and connecting with community members who've been doing this work and also been working to make it public. For me, that is what has been so rewarding is being able to say, you know, Norma Longoria Rodriguez, thank you for letting me interview you. I'm going to write this book that will come out in you know, five years and you'll get to read it then, but to continue to work with descendants. and people like Norma Longoria Rodriguez really shaped the work that we conducted with Refusing to Forget. Um, it, was, it was descendants like her that said, you know, if you want to have an exhibit at UT, fine. If you want to have a historical marker that you fundraise for and you unveil yourself in South Texas, fine. But unless state institutions are participating, we won't feel like we've made progress because we've been memorializing and commemorating these tragedies ourselves. It's time for there to be a public acknowledgement and for the state to participate in that. And so that's been very motivating to say, you know, I, I, that this is a collaborative effort and that I'm not doing it alone, but that I am mobilizing my credentials and the doors that will open to me that have been closed to others to try to advance uh, the efforts of, of, of truthfully uh, uh, acknowledging these histories. I, I would also say that in terms of um, uh, the part of the urgency for these histories and doing this work is that it, they have such urgent lessons for the challenges that we are confronting today. So for every historical marker that we unveiled, those were unveiled in counties where there are private prisons and detention centers. Um, those are counties where, you know, the newest buildings are not school buildings or a new community center. They are border patrol <laughs> facilities. Um, and so the, as a society, we have to learn these histories of the U.S.-Mexico border, of the violence of the border to really help us rethink 
um, our immigration policies today that were, it, it, especially the policies that criminalized migration and criminalized people that lived along the US-Mexico border, that those were laws that were designed by eugenicists and nativists and people like Claude B. Hudspeth. And, and so um, in terms of grappling with the weight uh, and the emotion of the history, the, what motivates me is that, that the violence continues. Um, and so we have to, there's an urgency to make sure that we learn from the past because what we have seen is our failure to learn from the past has allowed violence to continue to shape policing, to shape institutions and to shape society. Wonderful. Thank you so much for thank you so much for um, that um, thorough um, response. Also, and and I'm also thinking about just how important it is uh, all the sustainability that you've uh, created around this 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 project. It's just amazing. And, and I, I I I'll uh, I dropped into the chat the refusing to forget uh, link because there's also an opportunity to do, to donate there um, if you if you so wish to do that. Uh, I take that liberty and asking on your on your on your team's behalf. We have a question from our audience, um, Priscilla Ibarra. She says, "Thank you so much for your amazing work and your talk today. As we know, the violence you discuss continues on a continuum up to today, and we still have to fight to teach our stories in the schools. For example, politicians against CRT." Now the question, to what extent do you sense that the families you work with or the students you work with, or even yourself are feeling drawn to the abolition movement? That is defunding the police and prisons, but also remaking all our institutions, including the university. That's a great question. I mean, we certainly have to change <laughs> our ideas about policing. Um, in the United States, not just on the border, but across the country. And, and part of some of the work that I've, I've done over the past year and a half has been with other historians of immigration in the Migration Scholars Collaborative, which have really pulled together trying to write public facing pieces, but also write things like um, amicus briefs for uh, uh, legislation, um, but also for um, different court cases. And, and the sort of coordinated effort there is that as historians and as scholars of migration and immigration and policing, we realize that, that, that we really, an urgent, there has to be an urgent push to decriminalize migration. And, and so in terms of, of thinking about the, the, the wasted, you know, the billions of dollars that are being wasted, um, detain, detaining people, policing the borders, um, the, the kinds of rhetoric of the threat of the border, um, the criminalization that, that happened a hundred years ago is still with us. And, and so, so absolutely, I think that uh, unfortunately um, the public is, there's public support for decriminalizing, for example, drugs in the United States. Um, that kind, I mean, that, that, that effort to decriminalize um, certain activities, uh, to recognize the, the harm caused by the quote unquote war on drugs that disproportionately impacted black and brown lives. Um, there's been tremendous success in raising public awareness of the, the harm caused um, through the quote unquote war on drugs. Um, unfortunately, I haven't seen uh, a public shift in, in, in uh, how people understand um, what's called, you know, the policing of the border for quote unquote border security. And so we have a, a longer way to go um, to raising public awareness of the kinds of violence and atrocities that take place that since, uh, you know, strategies like Operation Gatekeeper were, what were put into place in the 1990s, that thousands of people have died trying to cross into the United States, um, that, uh, you know, unfortunately, the shooting of somebody like Concepcion Garcia, who was only nine years old when she was shot and killed in the early 20th century, that border shootings continue um, today. And so, and I, and I think I'm also deeply troubled that um, after the horrors of the family separation uh, project were uh, 
when there was finally a, a national and international awareness of the horrors of that policy that separated thousands of children from their family members, um, I, I, I did think that, that there would be um, more efforts, there are more calls by public audiences to say, you know, this is a human rights issue. These are violations of human rights that need to be remedied. Um, and unfortunately, as the years have passed, there are still hundreds of children who have not been reunited with their families. And it is, um, uh, it has been disheartening also to see um, that some of the Trump era immigration policies have continued under the Biden administration. And so, um, and we are only a few years, uh, uh, only a few years have passed since the shooting um, in El Paso, the massacre at, uh, in 2019 in El Paso. Um, so in addition to the kind of harm by policing on the US-Mexico border, um, hate crimes against Latinx people, hate crimes against Asians, Americans, um, and also African Americans and Jewish Americans continues to rise. And, and so we are in a moment where, where we have to think about um, social justice, racial justice um, as an urgent issue. And that is an urgent issue on the US-Mexico border as well. Thank you so much uh, for, for your answer. Um, we, I, we have uh, two more questions. If there are any other additional questions, please feel free to add them and we will make them available to uh, Dr. Munoz Martinez after the, the session. So I'll ask the next one by Jose Angel Hernandez. And he says, in the spirit of, uh, quote, quote, cautious descriptions and evidence, end of quote, could you say more about the changing historiography over the numbers? We've just gone through an epidemic and quickly learned that the numbers matter. And as such, Walter Prescott Webb once estimated that 5,000 dead Mexicans in order to glorify ranger violence during this area and with no evidence. Now that number is down to around 120 or so from what I remember according to the work of Trinidad Gonzalez. Now to the question, where do you, where do you think that historiography is today? And do you think Mexican archives might assist you in getting a more contextualized history of, the, of this violence. Why the shift in these changing numbers is such a drastic matter? And uh, he has one more clarification. It appears in Toribio Rodriguez's testimony, he was shot by Manuel Saldaña. So, and he says, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's a great question. There's a lot there. So I, I'm happy to, to speak about the numbers specifically, but also in, in the case of Toribi Rodriguez, um, yes, so he, there was a posse of Texas Rangers, but also um, he identified Manuel Saldana and Andres Uresti as, as people who were in the presence of the posse. So some of the work that the graduate, excuse me, that this undergraduate class did was actually pull together um, from testimonies from the 1919 investigation that, that provided the names of Texas Rangers that participated um, and actually found that there were Texas Rangers in Captain J.J. Sanders' um, uh, company that participated. If I, if I had more time and these, this information with me, I would, I would share their names. Um, but certainly, so the, the, um, the dying declaration led us to help to find um, reports that were actually filed by the local Brownsville Police Department, but also um, testimony that was provided not only by Texas Rangers like J.J. Sanders, but also by some of the witnesses. So there were um, several witnesses. I think if I go back to oh, oh, the dying declaration, there were one, two, three, four, five, six, at least six um, witnesses that, that signed on to that dying declaration. And Mr. Krieger was one of the um, attorneys who went on to testify in 1919 for more information. And so this was um, a, a complicated case for the students to research because it helped them to break down this association that violence, the anti-Mexican violence fell along white and brown lines. Um, one of the Texas Rangers from this era who committed a number of murders was Daniel Hinojosa. Um, another was named John Eds. Um, and although 
his name doesn't reveal um, in the investigation in 1919, um, it, he is identified as having a mother um, who is of Mexican origin. He corrects the uh, interviewer and says, no, she's Spanish. Um, and so we, of course, understand, you know, that 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 separation that he was trying to make, but but certainly that these acts of violence were not only committed by um, by white law enforcement or or Anglo vigilantes, but by also by some um, uh, Mexican origin, you know, in the case of Daniel Hinojosa, his family had 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 been in the region for generations. Um, and conversely, there were also uh, Anglo Texans who are a part of the social justice archive for speaking out against the violence. Um, people who, who documented the violence, uh, people like Sheriff um, William T. Vaughn from Cameron County, who called for the Texas Rangers to be removed from the county because they were committing acts of violence. He personally wrote, documented a case where he saved um, Mexican men who were in the custody of a Texas Ranger. Um, the other prisoners that he was not able to remove from their custody were later uh, found, shot, and killed. So, so certainly, I think that your point about pointing out the involvement of people like Manuel Saldana and Andres Uresti, um, Uresti's name appears in other uh, cases of, of violence. Um, so, you know, that, that breakdown between the white and, and brown binary here is important. To your, num to your question about numbers, um, you know, this is part of what motivated the mapping violence project uh, in general was that I was frustrated by this this wide ranging case, uh, you know, expressions of numbers. Um, and so to actually try to document as many cases of racist violence as possible. Um, I so I'm, we're still not done in the in the recovery effort, and I think that to your point, the Mexican uh, archives, especially by Mexican um, in, in the Mexican consulate, uh, are quite important. There was um, reporting of of uh, in 1922, um, and actually a Washington Post article published a letter by a Mexican um, consul who was pleading with the U.S. State Department um, to, uh, to stop Texans from murdering Mexicans. Um, and that was in 1922. And that, that letter included the names of 12 more victims that had been killed since 1920 to 1922. And so there, there certainly is an ongoing recovery effort. Um, and I know that unfortunately, we won't be able to recover all of the names. But this is you know, some of the work that, that thanks to the journalism, we are able to, to find names, to find more cases. Um, but, uh, you know, there wasn't a comprehensive effort in the same way that the NAACP or people like Ida B. Wells were collecting the names of lynching victims. Um, and, so, and so we're doing the work, you know, 100 years later. Thank you so much for for that, Monica. Because I, I I really like the 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 your term the corrupt archive, and I think it also alerts us right to the fact that there are many ways of interpreting and, and gathering information and collecting and 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 like thinking right in in, in seeing like all these uh, variety of data that's available. Um, I mean, and and I think the some of the work that you've done to represent all of these materials to us is, is, is very telling. And, and of course, you know, the award that you receive is really important because it really recognizes your, your efforts in presenting and documenting this, this, this work. Um, Thank you. There is, I, there, you have two questions. I think um, I, I, we're gonna take uh, uh, Jose Aranda's questions first, uh, which uh, indicates that one, he wants to know what has been your experience with sharing and presenting your work to Anglo Texans? That thank you for that question. Um, I've been I've been I've been heartened by the conversation. So I should say that refusing to forget, for example, has received messages from Anglo Texans who identify themselves as being descendants of Texas Rangers. And so I have received emails, but also the Refusing to Forget team has received messages from people on Facebook or on social media saying, you know, I am the descendant of a Texas Ranger who had a career in this era 
And I've always been proud. I remember one of the messages expressing, you know, I've always been proud of my grandfather and his career as a Texas Ranger. And we celebrated that. But now I wonder if he was ever involved in these cases. And so there's been a, a, a multiple occasions where people have been asking for information in the mapping violence database because they wanted to know if there were any uh, if there was any evidence that, that one of their uh, relatives had participated in active violence. And so that um, is, you know, reflects uh, members of the community who are, are, who are prepared to have a conversation about uh, the past, even if it might implicate one of their relatives. Um, in the, the cases of people reaching out to me, I was not actually able to find um, their relatives' names in any of the records that we had uncovered so far. Um, but the I've also um, met uh, residents in Texas who are conducting their own research into events um, that their uh, that their relatives participated in, um, and and thinking about that history critically. So. So those are just some examples of people who who are interested in the past, and rather than you know wanting to run away from it or actually saying you know if I if my family um, played a part in this I want to know, um, and there are examples of people uh, of efforts in in the South and Mississippi certainly, in places like South Africa, where descendants of people on both sides of the violence victims and aggressors come together in conversation and that that can be a form of restorative justice that people generations removed from the violence can come together in a conversation um, and so you know I think that there's possibilities for that to happen here in Texas you know there should be <laughs> it shouldn't just be you know scholars who are doing this work there should be a truth and reconciliation commission um, into this period of violence, because again, it's not just Texas Rangers that were committing acts of anti-Mexican violence. Some of the same Texas Rangers were moving around the state targeting different racial and ethnic groups. So by focusing on recovering the actions of, of aggressors, we've also found that Texas Rangers were moving around intimidating Mexican residents in South Texas and then going and intimidating NAACP members in East Texas. Um, and so these are interconnected histories, but this period of state sanctioned racist violence violence is one that unfortunately we are just starting to confront, um, but, but, but not in a statewide uh, way that it, in which it needs to be done. Thank you, Monica. We have what, one last question, which it has to, it, it has to do with, um, um, it's that people are interested in your K through 12 and the K through 12 resources that you mentioned. And if, if you would, wouldn't mind sharing some of those uh, resources, and perhaps a way in which uh, young students have responded. Uh, and then I will end right after you answer your, that question. Thank you. Yes, so the Refusing to Forget website does have a section on resources where people can access the lesson plan um, on Jovita Edad and another list. It also has a list of media, um, so videos and, and short interviews and things that can be helpful in the classroom, but also just for public education. But part of the work that I'm hoping to, to build on over the summer and the next year is actually to create more teaching resources to make them free and available and to make them grounded in primary sources and actually state records records um, so that uh, in the current context of when there's questions about what teachers can do in the classroom um, that we can try to be uh, as 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 um, informed about uh, what drawing from the, the to state teaks for example um, to build uh, lesson plans that can shine a light on this history, um, but can do so in a way that can be supportive of teachers themselves. But that also does require <laughs> that in addition to just creating resources that historians are involved in informing the public about uh, the devastating impact of, of some of the recent legislation passed, not just in Texas, but across the country. That um, although, for example, the legislation passed during the special session that, um, you know, this educational gag order that was passed, you know, in the name of trying to suppress critical race theory, that that law doesn't even include the word critical race theory. And so 
I think that historians, um, organizations have to participate in informing the public about uh, the impact to schooling, but also figure out how historians can, can mobilize our resources to make the histories that we have recovered accessible to the public, whether it's online, um, in a digital publication, because if we are gonna be entering uh, a period of time where students, it's going to be harder for students or where teachers feel like it's going to be harder for them to teach some of these histories, then we have to make that information available to the public in other ways. And so this is, you know, also a pitch and a thanks to the leadership in, in Latinx digital humanities um, at the University of Houston, because, you know, as a, as a field, historians are behind <laughs> in developing public facing projects, but also digital projects. And, and it, it may be uh, one of the only ways that people are able to access this history in the future. And so, and so that's a resource that we should, should, um, should utilize. Well, thank you, Monica. Thank you so much for um, graciously you know, working with us towards some of the difficulties that we had. We thank everyone for joining with us today. Um, there are many, you know, uh, congratulatory remarks and applauses, you know, in the chat. There's a couple of questions that were left unanswered. We will share them with you and, and share okay. the contact information for the person who who, did, um, who asked the question. Um, but um, we wouldn't be we couldn't be more honored than to have you, you know, speak with, speak today to our to our community. Um, congratulations on, on again on your awards and and. Uh, People, please uh, continue to support these projects and and and, and share this information, and um, and thank you so much for for being with us uh, today. We will reconvene at 1:30 p.m. again. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> what do we do now? <laughs> I guess we we just leave and then the we hop back onto the other Zoom for the other panels. Or, yeah, yeah, and we'll 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 close this down. And yeah, if anyone is interested in looking at the at, we you know we will clean up the the recording and then make it share it with our communities. We'll share it with you before we we share that with everyone else. <laughs> Thank you so much for to both of you. Oh my, that oh. was awesome. I hope it was helpful. Um, well, I, I, if I didn't plug it enough, I'm, it wouldn't have been possible without that grant, the Texas grant in 2010. So it feels like a, a community celebration. Yes, it is. Let us know when you come to Houston. Okay, I will. I will. <laughs> Take care Hopefully more. soon. Hopefully maybe this summer. Yes. Please do. Okay. So we can have a cup of coffee or go to eat something. Absolutely. Take right, care, thank Monica. you.